powerful mm. and evidence-based <laughs> speech. So a couple of things I got from, from his speech. One is urgency. Yes, we do hear that we must end you know, hunger, malnutrition, particularly child starvation, urgently because they are costly. It's a moral issue. It's a human development issue, human capital issue. It's also <coughs> economic issue. Uh, the other one is evidence-based. We needed to focus on evidence. So with evidence, we can accelerate that progress. So think about your questions and uh, uh, challenge Kim. Uh, sorry, Dr. Dr. Kim or, or Jim. <laughs> Some of the issues that he has raised. Uh, I think uh, this is a great opportunity to challenge him, challenge the World Bank. Uh, what do we have done? What can we do even better? So who can we start? Okay. Uh, how much time do we have? We, we, have, 30, we have almost 30 minutes. Okay, yeah. oh, 30 minutes. So let's start with, um, okay, with the front here, yeah. Yeah. and then we move back to the back. How about that? We, Thank you, Dr. How Kim. We group three or four questions together. Sure. Yeah, Jim. All right. Uh, I'm John Coonrod with The Hunger Project, and my question is, uh, you've, you've given this a lot of thought, and I really appreciate the addition of a financial strategy to the human capital strategy. Reflecting on the experience in the U.S., where the U.S. has been scoring badly on human capital things for many, many years, um, it hasn't led us to raise taxes. Um, and I'm just wondering how you, as you've thought about this and looked at the U.S., how you've seen uh, a social strategy can actually reverse these trends and make this happen. Um, because it's, as you said, it doesn't, it's not going to happen by itself. It's going to take a real strong push. So I'm wondering, as you reflect on the U.S. experience, what does that tell you? Sure. Okay, well, thank you, John. So U.S., all right? Let's move uh, to this, this side. To yes, the back, lady. Right maybe a lady. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. That's right. Gender balance. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Kim. This is an online question oh, from online question. North Carolina uh, High School called Cabral High School. They have a question oh, for yes. you. <laughs> they come see me every year, this, this high school. Great. Yes. Hi, everybody in Cabral. All right. Yeah. Yeah, they are watching. Yeah. So your idea about helping developing countries to collect taxes could uh, obviously have a profound impact on social services in these countries. Are there developing countries who are doing a good job of this now, and how do we build upon their successes? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Another tax question. OK, there's another lady. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Kim, Lucy Sullivan um, with Thousand Days. Um, thank you for um, a terrific presentation. Very exciting to hear about the Human Capital Project, and, and very much look forward to the index. Um, how can how can we, as a as a community, as advocates, um, help the bank uh, take even more leadership um, with respect to mobilizing new resources, uh, particularly domestic resources and innovative sources of financing? Shall we begin all these Yes, yeah, let me start sure. with those. Yeah. So yeah. first of all, on, on the U.S., you know, um, so uh, we don't work in the U.S. at the World Bank Group. And uh, the articles of agreement of the World Bank uh, Group uh, uh, dictate that, um, that World Bank Group staff, and especially me, don't get involved in the internal politics of uh, <laughs> countries. And, and, and having said that, um, let, me, let me tell you... <laughs> about some of the reactions that we're getting. So, so I, I gave this uh, Human Capital Project talk first in Seattle uh, to a group of people who were celebrating the 20th anniversary of the global burden of disease. And, and one of the heads of the UK health system said, we desperately want you to do a, a, an almost like neighborhood by neighborhood analysis of, of, uh, of human capital. Because of course, what we'll do is that we'll put funds into the areas that have the lowest human capital. Pretty, pretty natural thing to do, right? But um, I think in the US, actually the exact opposite happens, right? And so um, th this, is a, this is an internal political question for the US. But um, I, I think that we're going to be able to show uh, that, that there are some countries that are just you know, outliers in terms of very high human capital uh, given um, their uh, GDP per capita. You know, China and Vietnam are probably the two highest. Um, and then there are others that are quite low. And I think you're going to see huge variation in the United States. You're going to see some uh, areas that, that, that they're all, their stock of human capital might be lower than the average of some developing countries. I mean, I, I think you will see that. And I, I think that, um, you know, I don't know that we will publish that. We probably won't. But I think the University of Washington will. 
And what I, what I hope is that it starts a conversation. You know, what does that mean for us? You know, what does that mean for those regions, those parts of the United States uh, that have had really very low uh, uh, improvement in human capital over the last 15, 20 years, and have also had very low economic growth? What, what, what does that suggest? I, I think the example of countries using um, subnational studies to invest more in the places that need more is a great example for everyone to follow. And we, we hope that, that, uh, that the demand for our financing and our expertise will lead to um, uh, a, a completely different world. I mean, to put it most simply, we want to go from supply driven. If you give it to us, we'll spend it to one that's demand driven. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, my bond spreads just went up. You know, and I, 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 I have to pay more for capital. What do I do? Um, how can I improve my outcomes very quickly? So I think, you know, for, from our perspective, it's great because they're not going to come to us asking to build tertiary care hospitals. They're going to ask us to say, how can, how can we ensure that everyone's vaccinated, that, that you know, the, the public health part is in place, because we know that that's really going to help them improve outcomes much more quickly uh, than, uh, than, than tertiary hospitals, right? I have nothing against tertiary hospitals. I think they're really important for every country in the world. But I think it's going to bring some order, because they have to come to us and ask us not, can you give us money? They have to ask us, what would it take to change outcomes? Right? Now, uh, in terms of collecting taxes, you know, it's hard for me to name specific countries. Right? But uh, along with the IMF, we have offered to every single country in the world that we will give them direct technical support on better domestic resource mobilization. But one of the, one of the, you know, and some of it is, is technical. Some of it is that the people who work in the tax bureau just don't have the skills to be able to do it. Sometimes there's just not enough people. Sometimes uh, the, the, everything is done on paper and not electronically. And so there's, there are some technical fixes that can happen, and we're very much ready to do that. But the thing we found is that the most important thing is political will, that, that you know, the, the, um, the leaders have to be ready uh, to go after people who are used to not paying their taxes and get, in, get them to pay their taxes. Now, you know, my, I don't know if this will happen, but my hope is that uh, if foreign direct investment drops and, and the cost of borrowing goes up, that affects everybody, even the richest people. Right? So you know, I, I'd love to see rich people knocking on the door saying, OK, we're ready to pay our taxes now, because we, we really know that we have to invest in our people if we want, if we want to, to be competitive uh, in, in the economy of the future. Now, I, again, I don't know if this will happen, but the reason I'm talking so much and so directly about it is because I want everyone to be prepared. This is coming. Right? And when this comes, uh, the, the, the story you can tell is, well, I don't believe the, the ranking, and I don't like the methodology. Uh, that's one story. Or the other story is, we're serious about this. Here are all the new things that we're, we're doing to invest more in our people, whether it's uh, you know, uh, 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 you know, postgraduate education, skills training, better. Uh, you know, everyone has to pay more attention to nutrition, especially in the poorest countries. Uh, you know, these things, you, in other words, you can temper the response to the ranking by being serious about improving uh, uh, human capital. And on mobilizing new resources, you know, uh, it's Lucy. Lucy, I, I, I think that what would be most helpful is uh, uh, to help us get the word out about the human capital ranking. Because, um, uh, it, you know, the classic approach has been to go and get donors to invest in, like, the next thing. That's great. I spent most of my adult life doing that. It's still necessary. But it's, it, it, as long as it's supply driven, we're not going to get anywhere. I mean, there's many African countries that spend less than 1% of GDP on health. You know, a, a particularly large one that spends 0.76% of GDP on health. And most of what they spend on health comes to them in the form of grants, right? It, 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 we're just, it, it, nothing's going to happen if that's the situation. You know, the burden, the, 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 the burden of action can't be on us and donors. The burden of action has to be shared. I mean, I, I think I would never suggest that donors can back away from this. What I would suggest is that if donors would put money into, say, the global financial facility, finance, or, or other ways of taking their, their, their grant money and then just leveraging it and making it a much bigger sum, that would be great. So if you can talk to donors about you know, uh, always thinking about how to leverage what they're providing so that it's a bigger number, that would be great. Well, while you're thinking of questions, um, Jim, I have a couple of questions. You mentioned about this $500 billion used in agriculture to subsidize stable food production with the food and other subsidies, water subsidies, electricity subsidies, $500 billion. Yeah. But in the meantime, the whole CGI annual budget is less than $1 billion. Yeah. Total agriculture <coughs> research investment 
not just CGI, including China, India, Brazil, probably less than $10 billion. So how can we really communicate that message to national leaders like Xi Jinping, I know you know him very well, or Prime Minister, Mr. Lee? Y y yes. Can I tell you that? Can I tell you my Xi Jinping story? My yeah, I would do story? that. But so it's it's how, directly related to agriculture. I'll tell right. you. Right. I'll tell you the story. Yes. Yeah, how later. can we really, you know, make sure that the the, the politicians or national leaders are aware of this issue, and uh, to create some sort of evidence based advocacy, not just in top leaders but also the the whole political landscape, yeah. particularly in India. Yeah. You know, I remember, you know, our our friend. Um, 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 Onuwalia, uh, Montag Onuwalia, yeah, yeah. he used to work for the World yeah. Bank. You know, we told him how bad the subsidy is. He said, well, just like you said, don't tell me. You know, I don't know this. I know this. But my party, Congress party, wants to be reenacted. But obviously it failed. Yeah. So how can we, can we really convey the messages, provide the evidence to the top leaders, to the, all the political constituents in the countries to move away from this unproductive, yeah. unsustainable So, so Shang Yen, I, I, you know, I, I would ask um, uh, Jurgen just to stand up and g give us, because he, he knows this inside and out, but here's what I would say. I think one of the things that we need to focus on um, is to, to look at the actual outcomes from these different subsidies, right? So what, what are these subsidies actually getting for you, right? And uh, if the answer is the subsidy, what the subsidies are getting for us are votes. I, I just think we have to be honest about that and say, come on, you know, th this is not how you should use your money. And if we can create a, a, a tremendous sense of urgency around sort of better nutrition, investing more in people, then I think that they would hold their own um, uh, people who are deciding on the subsidies to a higher standard. But can we give uh, Jürgen? Because Jürgen, 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 Jürgen has the, the, uh, right. the, Jürgen, the yeah. Yeah. so so I, I think. You know, one of the things that has just been revolutionary for us is this thing we call the program for results, P for R. Mm -hmm. And so it's program for results, but it's really paying for results, right? So, so we, um, we, we make a commitment, but then we don't give you the money up front to do it. What we do is we give you the money after you show us that you've had particular outcomes, right? And, the, the, you know, ministers of finance actually really like this because they just take the, 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 the P for R and extend it to their own teams. They'll say, okay, you show me the results, we get the money, I give it to you. And so I, I, I think, uh, you know, again, this notion um, uh, that, um, you know, that, 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 that Martin Foreman talked about of evidence, you know, evidence of, uh, of outcome, not just, not, not just you know, evidence of expenditure, but evidence of outcome. And, right. and, and Jürgen, mm -hmm. he's taught me everything I know about <laughs> agriculture, so I dare not uh, butcher this, uh, this particular one. Go ahead. Thanks for putting me on the spot, Jim. It's <laughs> <laughs> great. <laughs> in, in two minutes, or in, in, in actually in three sentences, right now the world spends half a trillion dollars per year to support its farming system globally. And what are the effective outcomes? It is unsustainable agriculture and its poor nutritional outcomes. That's what you get from the subsidies. Between 80 and 90 percent of that money leads to exactly that outcome. No government in the world really wants that, I believe. We don't even have, need to go to the votes. Our argument used to be reduce the subsidies because it's wasteful and bad. That show, they show you the door. Nobody wants to hear that because who's going to elect me next time? Now we're saying keep the 500 billion per year, but use it for something that has better nutritional outcomes and has better sustainability outcomes, including better climate outcomes. And you can give it to the same farmers for all that matters. And you can move it from an input mm -hmm. to an outcome support. What if you, your cattle herd has a lower emissions footprint, less methane? Well, you get support from the government. Not as a subsidy and for the vote, but because it's in the public interest to do that. And the same with nutritional outcomes. If the money goes to five staple crops, it makes them cheaper in the world. Obviously, if half of that money would be invested in fruits, nuts, and vegetables, what the things we really should be eating, you better believe that there would be different outcomes. And so this is not as complicated as it seems. And in Davos, we are moving this conversation forward and in the G20 as well. Yeah. That's the line we're taking. Thank you. I want to hear from you about your story with Mr. Xi. Mr. Xi, OK. <laughs> so it's, a, it's very much an uh, agriculture related story. So when I first met him five, now more than five years ago, um, uh, it was one of the first visits, and I met him. Um, uh, I, in reading about him, I, I read that he used to work in agriculture. And when he was working in agriculture, uh, he came to the United States and he spent about a month uh, living in a particular town, um, studying the agricultural system 
you know, in the United States. And it turned out that that town was my hometown. Oh, in right? Iowa. It's yeah. where I grew mm -hmm. up in Iowa, right? Mm -hmm. So when I went to see uh, President Xi for the first time, I, I said, President Xi, it's an honor to meet you. You know, we have something in common. And he said, I know, you're from Muscatine, Iowa. <laughs> How are the Landys, <laughs> right? And th this was the lawyer family in town, and my father was a dentist family oh. in town. So we knew these people uh, right. quite well. So uh, every time I see him now, we have a little joke about, mm. uh, you know, both being from Muscatine, Iowa, our hometowns being right. Muscatine, Iowa. Right. That's right. Yeah, he was re sort of re-educating a rural <laughs> town in that's right. somewhere in, in China. So that's, <laughs> that's right. That's right. That is well, Okay, yeah. can we have another round? Yeah. Okay, it's Bev, and then the one uh, behind you. Hello, Dr. Kim. Thank you very much. And uh, you'll remember just over a year ago, you were giving a very, very impressive speech in Iowa as part of the ah, World Food Prize. Yes. And uh, we're here in the home of biofortification. I'm asking this, uh, this question on behalf of the Harvest Plus family, both here and dialing in around the world. A year ago, we were celebrating a landmark for biofortification. Dr. Howdy Buis was being honored in Iowa along with three other laureates. And you made a very powerful connection between micronutrient malnutrition and human capital. A year on, we've had some startling evidence that now shows direct impact of biofortified crops improving cognitive impairment in a very rapid and cost-effective way. So what do we do now to scale up this tool that we have? And what are the problems? And my question to you is, where are the silo breakers? How do we break down these silos between the financial systems in agriculture and health. Because this is solving a health crisis, but we're doing it through an agricultural intervention policy. The bank is modeling that silo breaking. We've got Jürgen sitting next to Mira, right, yeah, right here. Yeah. Um, so what can, we, what can we do to accelerate, so to accelerate those silo breakers? And how do we reach that billion people that I promised you we'd get to a year sure. ago? Very good. Thanks. Good question. So, no. uh, uh, can we wait another? Well, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah, just right behind you. All right. Uh, Dr. Kim, Paul Miller, Lutheran World Relief. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. Um, very thought provoking. Um, I was thinking of a conference on nutrition in this town about two or three years ago in which a number of representatives said that you know, there'll be so many people in the, in the world in 2050, you know, billions more, and American agriculture is gonna feed all those people. The next presentation <laughs> said, American agriculture is killing the world with what we're exporting. <laughs> So I, I guess I've heard a lot about donors um, reacting to the capital, uh, uh, human, human capital index and about ministers of finance. How about the private sector? How will they be encouraged, uh, prompted, and participate, and maybe they already are, um, because some of them have very important interests. Uh, your, your, your partner once called them pathologies of power, interests in keeping the status quo and some of those subsidies. How and what's the plan um, uh, both financially and socially for, for that question. sector. Yeah. Yeah. Could I have another hand from maybe this side? Okay, there's another lady behind me. Hello. Thank you. Um, my name is Melissa Antel. I work for the Manoff Group. And I read a book called Mountains Beyond Mountains growing up, and that definitely shaped my, my path to this seat. Mm -hmm. So it's an honor to ask you a question. So you talk about the future of our economy. Could you share your thoughts on the future of public health? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, all right. OK, so, uh, so I, I've seen some of the studies on bio. That, it's, it's really exciting, right? And so how do you, how do you break down silos? So I, I, what I would say is I'm doing the best I can to encourage. I mean, so, you know, I, the stuff that Jurgen's doing, I just, I just visited the agriculture um, uh, uh, global practice yesterday, right? And the stuff that they're doing, I think, is great. And, 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 and the, uh, uh, for us, the breakdown of silos is happening. Keith, you know, is head of uh, health, nutrition, and population. Definitely, we're breaking down silos. So we're doing that. But here's the, here's what the conclusion I came to. Right? The conclusion I came to is that, um, that, that no, matter of, no, no manner of sort of going and giving more speeches and, and, and asking people to break down silos is going to help nearly as much is creating demand for biofortified uh, foods, mm -hmm. right? Uh, because uh, the, the, the power of the human capital ranking is not uh, in the ranking itself, it's in the fact that we're correlating 
actual health and educational outcomes to economic growth, right? So it, it, what, what I want the, to happen is for the countries to start asking a different kind of question, not will you give us money for this, but what will it take to improve my outcomes, right? And so if, if they're asking that question, then I think there's no question that they'll get to the biofortified foods, right? If we can tell them, well, look, you, 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 can, you can fool around, and you can still, you know, you can subsidize the, the local elite who want you to subsidize their, 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 uh, their grain production, or you can actually improve outcomes really quickly, and you may be able to create new incentives inside your own country so that, that they start growing these new, new strains. I, you know, I don't know the world well enough to know what will happen, but I know that the one thing that I can do, um, you know, as frankly as the World Bank Group, is to create overwhelming incentives to move in your direction. Right? And so I think that's what will break down the silos. Now, in terms of the private sector, you know, um, uh, uh, you know, when I was um, protesting against the World Bank Group, I, I was the editor of a book called Dying for Growth. And um, it was basically a 500-page screed against uh, uh, neoliberalism and uh, structural adjustment and all the things that the World Bank did. Right? But something happened since we started writing that book. We started writing that book in the mid-1990s. Right? And what happened is uh, China and Vietnam <laughs> embraced the market and China lifted 800 million people out of poverty. I, you know, there's not enough attention paid to that. No country, no region has ever lifted 800 million people out of extreme poverty. And they did it, they, they won't say they did it by embracing capitalism. They say this is socialism with Chinese features, right? They will say they changed the incentives, which they did, right? But, you know, uh, when I was going to grad school, you know, pe people in China, quick quote from Mao's Little Red Book, Schengen probably... Mm. I read it himself. some of them. Yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> but that's not what they quote anymore. What they quote is Deng Xiaoping, <laughs> who said, you know, in comparing uh, the, uh, 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 the market system versus uh, uh, planned economies that trade with each other, said, I don't care if the cat is black or white as long as it catches mice. That everybody knows. He said, some of us will get rich first. He said to get rich is glorious, right? He, he, the things he said changed everything. And so I think that any of us who care about evidence, as Martin Foreman did, will look at that evidence and say, what does it tell you that the head of the largest communist party in the world says the global market system is the ocean we all swim in, right? Uh, you know, are you going to be more left than him, right? Uh, <laughs> so, so, so for me, uh, if you look at any number of issues, right, there is not a hope on mm -hmm. Earth that we are going to be able to get ahead of global warming without a massive mobilization of the private sector. Right? So what we're focusing on now is we've got to make climate smart agriculture um, uh, the thing that everybody runs after. Right? The thing that all, you know, young people in, in, in studying agriculture have to just be burning with the sense that if I can do something really powerful for climate smart agriculture, I'm going to become rich and famous and, and admired all over the world, right? So uh, I, I think we learned something from China. I think we learned something from Vietnam. And I think it's that, that market forces, you know, if, if um, uh, uh, utilized effectively, are the most powerful thing that exists in the world. Unless we get a price on carbon, unless things like climate smart agriculture, you know, uh, uh, renewable energy, unless these things take off and the private sector chases it, we're not going to get there, right? So, I, what I hope is that if we can create incentives for every country in the world to ask the question, how do we improve our health and education outcomes, that the private sector will move to fill those spaces. And then what we'll get, I think we will, I, I, just, I just don't, I wish I could say that, that, that public sector approaches to health, education, social protection, hunger uh, will solve the problem. I just haven't seen evidence for that, right? I, I, I've been to all these countries, I just haven't seen evidence for that. So there's got to be some you know, uh, system where the government puts the rules in place. The government, uh, you know, uh, 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 focuses on e you know, equity of outcomes or, or, you know, equity and equity of access. But then the dynamism of the private sector has to, has to get involved. And uh, the future of public health. So, uh, um, uh, Melissa, thank you for that question. I don't know if you've seen the, uh, the, there's a movie that they just made about the work we did at Partners in Health called Bending the Arc. We've shown it a bunch of times uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in Washington, but if this particular community would like to see it, we could arrange another showing, uh, and it goes over what we did. So what I tell, um, what I tell public health uh, people 
is that the human capital index, the human capital ranking, could be the greatest boon for public health we've ever seen. Because right now, uh, there's not a demand for public health interventions per se, right? We, we, you know, um, uh, Keith spends so much time trying to push the idea that prevention is powerful, prevention is cheaper, you know, it, it, and, 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 and um, uh, it's like, um, well, if you give us the money for it, we'll do it, right? right? So if we can change that calculation and we can create overwhelming demand for improving health outcomes, then I think public health people are going to be very busy. That's my hope. Right. Well, Jim, we need to wrap up. Next week, next Monday and Tuesday, in the same room, the CGI leadership is going to come in here to discuss some of the most challenging issues for CGI. Could you spend 20 seconds to convey <coughs> your key messages to our CGI <laughs> colleagues? <laughs> well, I, you know, through, um, uh, through, through, through Jurgen, I think I've, um, I, I've communicated a lot of messages. But you, you right. know what my, my messages have been mostly, um, uh, you, the re research work you're doing is great, right? But why, hasn't, why haven't we seen more of an impact in Africa? Just, mm. just as one question, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Why haven't we seen it? Mm. And I, I um, so, so I think, you know, um, both Alan Berg and Martin Foreman focused on implementation, taking great ideas and making sure they work in the field. Now, I grew up in Iowa, and I just remember the, ex the agriculture extension workers were always all over the place. And, and, and their job was to, to bring the latest innovations and bring them to, you know, even the smallholder farmers. So that would be my challenge. How, how do we, let's say, let's say that the demand for, um, uh, for, for dramatically improving nutritional outcomes goes way up as a result of the human capital ranking. I hope it does. I'm, I'm not sure that it will. I, haven't, I, I really don't know. I hope it does. Um, uh, and, and the demand for better technology or for, for better ideas about how to, how to uh, uh, solve the um, uh, food security problem uh, goes up. Uh, will CGIAR be ready uh, to take the, the fruits of their research and make sure that they're, they're implemented all over the world? I, 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 know that, I know that there's a, there's a definite concern for that, but it's the question I keep asking. Mm -hmm. You know, the Green Revolution did not happen in Africa. And why? Why, 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 why did it not happen? And what can we do now, uh, uh, perhaps, to make it, uh, um, make it happen? Right. Uh, thank you, Jim. You know, I grew up in China. I was part of, part of that 800 million you mentioned, <laughs> the poor, hungry people. I was undernourished, <clears throat> but I was able to move out. And in fact, I benefit from the World Bank loan, the, the third um, or third phase education loan to China. Really? With that loan, I came to the uh, U.S. to study. Wow. And <laughs> so I wanted to tell you, human capital indeed is very critical yeah. for people no, to move up, move out, to prosper, this yeah. prosperity you, you just Absolutely. mentioned. But from CGIR side, you preside, you know, we are very much committed to do things very different, yeah. particularly to look at the agriculture food as a system to deliver multiple outcomes. You mentioned nutrition, human capital, poverty reduction, climate resilience, you know, agri-food system must be part of it, the climate mitigation. Uh, so I will convey your key message to my colleagues, CGI <laughs> colleagues. Look for results. Thank you. Look for evidence. And with that, that, you know, for all the people here, you know, working on nutrition, thank you for what you've done. Uh, you know, I just, I almost want to apologize that we haven't done, you know, that the world community hasn't done more uh, mm -hmm. to, 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 um, to live out what I read in the Nutrition Factor, you know, when I was a junior in college. What, you know, why haven't we done more there? And so, um, you know, we're going to try to do our part uh, by creating overwhelming incentives to finally, finally solve the problem of malnutrition in the world. That's Thanks great. very much. And there's yeah. some music. Yeah. Too many hours of nutrition is over here. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's a wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Thank, yeah. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.